think in the in the interest of, of time, we, we need to uh, start this session. Um, first of all, Leroy, welcome. Um, we uh, are looking forward to your, your presentation uh, format is that we have 45 minutes for this session. And um, uh, when you start, uh, we'd like to keep that section about half of it so that we have time for conversation with the, the jury itself for the uh, remainder of that, that period. Uh, to start this out, if I might, um, uh, I would like uh, each of the jurists to uh, uh, introduce themselves. Um, if you have not met um, Leroy, or even if you have, Edwin, would you start, please? Again, Edwin Fountain of the World War I Centennial Commission, which is developing the National World War I Memorial here in Washington. <clears throat> I'm also general counsel of the American Battle Monuments Commission, which designs, builds, and maintains American military cemeteries and memorials around the world. Good afternoon, John Adebech Cole. I am the <clears throat> Director Emerita of the National Museum of African Art here at the Smithsonian. Good afternoon, I'm Stephanie Birdwell and I'm the Director of the Department of Veterans Affairs Office of Tribal Government Relations and I'm also a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Todd Salak, good afternoon. My name is Brian McCormick. I'm an enrolled member of the Nez Perce Tribe and I'm a landscape architect. Larry Abakana Ulak. I'm from, uh, originally from Northern Alaska, Inupiaq. And um, I'm uh, an artist. Kia ora. I, I've been to New Zealand four or five times and just love it. And so, welcome. My name is Lillian Pitt, and I'm Warm Springs, Wasco and Yakima from Oregon and Washington, and I'm an artist, and um, I can't wait to see all your wonderful work. All the work has been so wonderful. Thank you. Aloha mai kaua. Kia ora. O vau kavika makei. Kavika makei, kanaka Maoli. It's my day job. I'm an environmental planner back home and uh, also a traditional cultural practitioner in the arts of hula, oli, and mo'olelo, and uh, kiu'alu. So, aloha. And <clears throat> Herman Viola, who is not, is not here yet, will, will join us in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, so I think I will <clears throat> um, Turn the uh, the uh, presentation over to you, um, and please welcome uh, Leroy Transfeld. Please. <clears throat> go for it. So it's ready to go. Tihe Moriora, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Koto Katoa. Aloha, Kiora, and Bulivanaka. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here. Actually, from the uh, the first call for proposals until now, it's actually been seven months, and uh, it's been quite a journey. And I've really enjoyed. Uh, the challenges and the traveling and the people I've met and creating uh, the design. And so I'm happy to present it to you today. Actually, while I was, uh, I was designing, that my, in my studio designing, this is what I was, um, this is what pushed me forward and, and, and made me work uh, even harder was that I was gonna have to present what I, um, I came up with, and so it better be good, because so, I'm not a very good used car salesman. <laughs> um, so the the first, um, uh, so the last time I was here, I introduced myself, and uh, there was one picture that I didn't get to show, so I'm just going to show that real quick. And this this is a picture of my uh, grandkids, and. Uh, 
Uh, Māori, you say uh, that's mokopuna. In Hawaiian, it's mo'opuna. And uh, we call them uh, mokos for short. And these are two of my mokos, and their dad is Navajo. And um, one day, the oldest one came up to me and said, Koro, and Koro is grandfather in Māori. And he said, Koro, I'm an Indian. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, that means I can shoot a bow and arrow. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. One, that he is starting to become aware of who he is. And uh, two, that uh, the, when he uh, was aware, he, he automatically knew that he was good at something, shoot, at uh, using an instrument that's for hunting and for war. And so I, I thought that was uh, really cool. And now in my studies, I read a lot of books, and I, I learned a lot of things. I already knew this, but Native American uh, people are innately have this innate ability and uh, uh, make ideal warriors. And um, uh, I read one of the best books. There's a lot of books out there, but one of the best books that illustrates this is uh, this book uh, by uh, Herman Viola. And in the book, I really enjoyed it because it uh, illustrated how uh, the warrior instinct. Now, there's one, there's one uh, particular story in there that I liked. It's a funny story. But it was during World War I, and uh, Indian soldiers were used as scouts. And they were, they were, um, the officers said that they were better than non-Indian uh, soldiers as scouts because um, they used their compass less there were uh, less chance of getting lost in the forest or in the dark. And, and to prove this, the officers did a test. It said here, officers of the 142nd Regiment tested this theory by sending five Indians and five non-Indians on a re reconnoitering exercise. All the soldiers were blindfolded. The officer reported that each of the Indians crawled to his objective, whereas the non-Indians crawled in every direction but the right one. I thought that was a cool story. And, and so the reason I'm telling you this stuff and about my grandkids is, is um, it's a cultural thing, it's a family thing, but it also goes even deeper than that. It go, it's in the DNA. So I wanted to, when I ca uh, came up with my design for the memorial, I wanted to show that, how it's a deep-rooted um, uh, inside uh, each Native American to be a warrior, to serve, and um, the talents and ability uh, are already there. And so uh, this is my memorial. Um, you can see, uh, I put this uh, picture up here because I wanted to talk a bit about the location. Um, as you know, I came here and I uh, walked around and this was, I felt, the best location because it's, um, the mall can sometimes be a noisy place. On the north side of the museum is the most quiet. It, ha it already has that existing wide path. If you look off into the distance, that is the main entrance to the mall. And then there's that water feature that, uh, there already. And so as people come in, they're gonna be drawn along that path uh, past the memorial, and then into the museum. And so I think that uh, with the wooded uh, environment there, uh, the tranquility of the water, um, it's an ideal location for the memorial. Uh, now, the statue of the buffalo dancer already exists. It's out there. And um, if you look out there, especially now because there's a lot of... Uh, growth out there, a lot of uh, vegetation that it set back a little bit and I think uh, it needs to be brought forward about four feet and be, uh, it could uh, support and uh, complement the memorial. Then it would be easier for people to have their photo taken with it and uh, as you stand at the entrance, that, that statue draws you uh, uh, forward to the memorial and then into the museum. And then from inside the museum, if people enter the museum from the street side, then uh, they, on the ground level, they'll have a clear uh, view of the memorial. And after they uh, go through the museum, 
they'll want to uh, go out and see what that is, what people are doing there, what that memorial is. So this is just an illustration to show you that there's already natural traffic flow that way uh, into the museum. There's the, uh, this is the memorial. Now, the name I've given it is the Ribbon of Time, and that is because I wanted to show that uh, deep-rooted uh, tradition that it, it's uh, been handed down through generations. And so my narrative is called the Ribbon of Time. And so this is the ribbon, and it's uh, from a, uh, looking down. It's broken into three sections. The reason I, I broke it up like that was, um, one, so that when people uh, go along there and you have the wooded vegetation area, you can look through, there's, get, there's breaks in the wall so people can uh, see what is, uh, have a better view of the vegetation. On the second break, uh, I want to have a place where people can um, place their tokens, their prayer uh, cloths, the um, sage or tobacco bundles or lays or any kind of uh, token uh, can be placed there right in the middle of the memorial. Okay, um, so um, I wanted to have a, a, a narrative there, some kind of a story that, that uh, uh, told about warriors, but it was, uh, it's a challenge because it has to cover all of uh, the, the regions of the uh, United States, Alaska and Hawaii. And so to come up with um, something that, that all uh, the native people have in common was a challenge. And so the first thing I had to do was to gain more knowledge. And so this is some of the uh, research I did. I had to read 57 books. Uh, webs I visited lots of websites. There's actually quite a few uh, websites out there that are uh, uh, talking about legends and native stories. I watched a lot of... Uh, um, productions, movies, and then after, uh, during my um, uh, creation process, I wanted to start a conversation with uh, um, people, native people, tribal headquarters, so I sent out lots of emails, 350, and from that I got 50 responses, and um, I thought that was pretty good, because I just sent this, these emails out from uh, nowhere, and, and uh, I got these responses, and so I was able to have uh, some phone conversations and email co conversations with people. And then as my, I get some rough drafts, I would send them to them and then, then they would uh, give me feedback. So the first thing I did to get uh, an idea of, of the uh, narrative that I wanted on the wall was to make this wood structure. And this was in my studio. And this is just to give an idea of scale and proportion. And so I decided to have some quotes in it. It's got four quotes in it. And um, so these were one of my initial designs. And so then what I did was I made these strips of paper and I would draw on them, draw different designs on them. And then as uh, I researched, you know, I said, this looks good, but it needs to improve. I actually made about 200 of these strips of paper. And in, in my... Uh, Room, room that I made them. There, the floor and my desk and all the walls are covered in these uh, strips of paper. And then my design would develop and evolve. evolve. And um, the final design that I came up with, I was really happy. And, but, uh, but it was a challenge because I had to go through this whole uh, discovery process. So there are the three uh, ribbons. And... Um, there's a narrative that goes on, creation, um, the coming forth of the animals, people, and then uh, addressing war, and then um, uh, recognition, and then into more healing aspects, uh, spiritual philosophy, uh, the meaning of life. I also wanted to point out that I got some of the inspiration from um, my design from the existing walkway on the south side of the museum. There's a, that shows the phases of the moon. And so I wanted to put that in my um, design too, because that was a good way to show uh, the time and the beginning of time. So this is the first ribbon. And um, 
this is mostly to do with creation and like I said, the bringing forth of uh, the animal life. And then it has a quote in there. And the quote is really good. I'm going to read it to you. So it says, We have lived upon this land from days beyond history's records, far past any living memory, deep into the time of legend. And that's Taos Pueblo uh, tribe. And um, I really like um, this quote and uh, the, the use of the uh, rings of a tree, I think, is a good way of showing the years and the expanse of time. And then I really liked uh, uh, the many legends about uh, the turtle. Of course, the, the most prominent one being the, the great turtle that uh, uh, the whole of North America rests on the back of a uh, turtle. And um, there are many um, legends. The turtle is referred to as uh, Mother Earth. The moon is like Grandmother Earth. And um, so... This is the second part of the first ribbon. There's a legend about uh, the flooding of the earth. There's lots of legends about the flooding of the earth. And one of them is the, how the great beaver uh, built up a huge dam and flood the, flooded the earth. And so I wanted to include that. Fish, the salmon fish, uh, abundance of sea life uh, for man and uh, for food and in, in its season. Then the birds are... A good example of, uh, I use this graphic because it's a good example of um, how we should treat each other, how uh, uh, animals uh, uh, show us how human beings should care and treat for each other, uh, treat each other. And then there's a lot of legends about uh, plants, and the three most dominant ones are the corn and tobacco and beans. And it's interesting, right now they're growing uh, corn and tobacco. Uh, on the south side of the museum, and the lady said they're going to be planting some beans soon. And, um, and they are gifts that are given to man, gifts from the creator. Okay, this is the second ribbon, and it begins with um, two babies, two papoose. And I wanted to uh, um, somehow talk about families and uh, the fragility of life, the creation of man. So I thought that, that even though it's just two babies, it says a lot more than that. It talks about, uh, it, it uh, alludes to the coming forth of man. Now there's lots of legends about animals, especially the coyote, the fox, and the wolf, and um, many other critters. And so I wanted to um, uh, somehow it's hard to, to use one image that portrays that, and so that's why I use the footprints, to sh uh, the paw prints to show all the different animals. And then the quote for that one is, one should pay attention to even the smallest crawling creature, for these two may have an, a valuable lesson to teach us. And because um, for animals, in native culture, animals are not just... Uh, something to be hunted or something to be used. In uh, many cultures, they are considered even as the, the ones that created man, and uh, they should be used and, and, uh, with respect and um, are not taken lightly. This, this second part of the second graphic, uh, ribbon, refers to... Um, War. This is where I, I talk about war. And so the first um, square you see there are three figures, and that's uh, talking about the War Council. Now, uh, before um, uh, any tribe or people go to war, there's usually some kind of del deliberation or ca uh, council. And so I wanted to refer to the War Council. In n many Native American cultures, there's actually a war chief and a peacetime chief. And so during uh, peacetime, uh, it's the peacetime chief, and then when, if a, but if a war is going to happen, then the wartime chief takes over because he is more familiar with tactics and what to do during a time of war. And then if the, uh, when the war comes to a conclusion, then the peacetime chief can negotiate and um, uh, make peace again. And then the second 
graphic is the Thunderbird. There are, are lots of reference to Thunderbirds throughout North American native cultures. And it's particularly to do with war. And it's an omen for war. If a warrior goes on a, um, a long fast and then they have a vision of the Thunderbird, then, um, then that means that they'll become a war chief. And then the, the, the graphic that shows the thorns, I wanted some kind of a, a legend that um, talks about why we have warriors. And so I used this one. I thought this was a really good legend. There are um, uh, rose hips. So the rose hips, uh, the critters used to eat all the rose hips because they tasted good. And uh, so the creator decided to make thorns on the bushes to help protect the um, rose hips. And in that way, I um, use that to refer to how we have warriors. Warriors are there to protect us. And um, so you can see I have uh, figures from the waist down marching in the same direction. From the left to right, uh, they're more traditional dress. And then as you get to, uh, to from the, uh, the left end, as you get to the right, it becomes a more modern uh, uniforms. And so that's supposed to show uh, the time uh, that, because this memorial is to recognize all wars, past, present, and future. And then the flag is there to show uh, unity uh, of one cause. And this is the third ribbon, the last ribbon. Um, on the, it shows the, uh, that's the graphic of the Congressional Medal of Honor because I wanted to show how Native Americans did not only serve in the military, but they served with distinction. The 29 Congressional Medal of Honors uh, awarded to Native Americans, along with many other citations and uh, uh, recognitions of valor. And then I move into the healing. There are many healing plants um, available in nature that uh, Native American use. Some are used in ceremonies like the tobacco and sage. And others are used um, as a poultice or as a tea. Uh, even uh, uh, food is considered uh, a, a healing thing to Native American people. And then there's a quote. The quote is, never has the earth been so lovely, nor the sun so bright as today. It's a simple quote, but what I wanted to evoke is a, a sense of gratitude. Now, most people who are going to come to the memorial haven't even uh, been, don't know anything about war, but I wanted them to read that, and then they say, the sun is shining on me because uh, some people have been to war, and they, and they have uh, laid their lives on the line or sacrificed uh, for, uh, for us. And then also, if they are a veteran and survived war, then they can come back and uh, uh, feel gratitude. It's kind of a healing thing. And so I really like that simple quote. And then this is the final part of the graphic. It shows the um, moth. This is the silk moth. The moth and the butterfly are very beautiful, pretty um, insects. And they were um, sent by the creator as a way to delight and comfort those that are aging and who... Um, uh, mourning uh, loss or death. Um, it's a spirit guide. If you open up uh, your window or something and some moths come in and, and fly around, it's supposed to be that your ancestors have come in to visit you. And then the, um, the final part shows a, a tree, a tree that's losing its, its leaves. This is to show the changing of seasons and... Um, uh, aging, and then the final quote, what is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in the wintertime. It is the little shadow that runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. That's by Crowfoot. And so, you, uh, so I just simply illustrated that quote. It has a buffalo and then that diagonal line of the firefly and then the um, tracking of the sun. And it was interesting when I did that too, also reminds me of the hoop dances. Um, 
So as far as the execution of the, uh, um, the um, narrative, the, I want, I'm going to have my friend, this is, uh, he's wearing the glasses, uh, James Goodman. He's a native uh, carver, native stone carver, and he lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he and I are going to get together a team to um, carve this, because I want it to be uh, done by native carvers, and so it will have more meaning. This is just showing you the, um, the, the three ribbons and then my model with the statue on the right side. And then uh, there you can see uh, the place to hang the prayer uh, cloths, and also um, along the top edge of the memorial, I want to have lighting so that it will help to bring out and highlight the relief carvings. I wanted to show you this because this is a mountain near my house. And if you look, you can actually see in the, um, uh, the patterns of the mountains that it's very similar to my uh, memorial. And I want it to look like that. I don't want it to be a slick and too um, manufactured looking, especially on the creation side that, uh, where it shows the moon and the mountains. I would like it to be even almost like it wasn't even done by a person, like it was just something that uh, the creator made. So this is the, um, my final uh, image. And I think that... Um, because of the, the setting, because of the way it will be rendered, uh, the, uh, uh, using native carvers, and because of the meaning behind it, the cultural meaning behind it, I think it will be uh, a memorial like no other in the world. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn it over to the jury for um, comment, uh, questions, whatever. I like, I like very much how, how this integrates into the uh, curvatures of the building itself, the stream, the woodlands. Uh, it integrates, I mean, it, this looks like it could have been built as an original part of the, of the site. Uh, and I think that's a, a tremendous asset. Um, uh, it, it, as you say, it takes advantage of one of the main entrances to the site uh, and gives uh, and, and gives a prominence. And then, by telling this extended story of sorts as you march through the progression, it, it creates a it, it gives it, it adds a dimension to that uh, to that pathway from the mall corner over to the entrance of the museum. Uh, you've shown great. Uh, care and thought, I think, in selection of the motifs and images and legends uh, and whatnot. Uh, you've created a space that can accommodate a number of different purposes, including, uh, I hadn't noticed before, the, the, the space there for the, the, the prayer cloths, uh, which I think is a good addition. Uh, one small question and then one big question. The small question is the buffalo dancer. Hmm. Have you incorporated that because it's there and you need to do something with it, or do you view that as an integral part of the design? Well, um, yeah, when I first saw the buffalo dancer there, I was like, oh, well, that's a, a big guy right, right there. Um, but then as I thought more about it, I read about uh, why it was placed there. And like I said, it was actually placed there to help draw people from the entrance uh, along that path. And then um, 
I realize as you look at the memorial, because it's a strong a horizontal line, and, I, and then I realized that the buffalo dancer helps to complement the memorial by almost uh, by helping to stop that movement. And uh, so they, they complement each other. Does that answer it? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. So my, my larger question is this. I'm not quite sure what the question is, but it's a beautiful work. And as I say, with great care and thought given to some compelling motifs and images, to my mind, the, the Native Americans veteran story is submerged in a lot of other, uh, in a lot of other stories. Uh, mm -hmm. There are, there are things that can be, that were I doing this, and I'm speaking purely personally, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, are you prepared to go in other directions on the, on the themes and the imagery? So as a, for instance, this is very heavy on sort of creation stories, mm -hmm. which to my mind are far removed from commemoration of military service. Mm -hmm. I thought the image of the rose hips and the thorns was very powerful. I could see that, that theme expanded uh, as something that's sort of more elemental and primal, yet leads into the military experience. On the back end, where you have the plants and the healing and the, I can see those themes expanded to reflect more of the loss and the memory and the sacrifice. Uh, but as it stands now, you've essentially got two images of military service. You've got the Medal of Honor and you've got the, the, the legs and feet. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the question is, tell me your thinking of in, in coming up with this series and were there alternatives that you considered and discarded, and if so, why? <clears throat> yeah, the challenge uh, like we were uh, given is to try, this memorial, like I said, is for all wars, past, present, and future. And there are many uh, stories, uh, many depictions there there are some legends on uh warriors and um fighting exploits um like i said i tried to make it because this is supposed to be inclusive of uh all native american people and um so that that was the biggest challenge is to try and come up with a a design a way to include uh, all people. I would be open to, uh, 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 if I uh, come up with more designs or edit the uh, narrative to uh, maybe uh, refer to military service more. Uh, the other thing, uh, from what I understand, inside the museum, there is going to be a permanent exhibit uh, that refers more to uh, things like in the, um, warriors in uniform, and that will expand upon it. And so this is not going to be a, a, def, a definitive memorial, standalone all by itself, that people have to learn everything about uh, Native American uh, veterans. They can also learn inside the mu museum as well. And, and um, so I wanted this memorial to be complementary to that and work uh, together with the exhibit that's going to be inside the museum. Mike Kaua again, um, mahalo for this presentation. Um, this struck a chord with me, I think, perhaps from the Maori, Maori you know, connection and relationship. Because I see the mo'okupuna idea of you know, talking about lineage and heritage, and that the fact that the element of war and service is, is a piece of a timeline of, of, of activity that we as humans participate in, uh, for better or for worse. And that really the things that we protect and honor are those things that go back to the beginning before we were here as Kanaka. Mm. And so, uh, so I totally get and appreciate the, the, the use of and importance of uh, telling the story of the beginning and the transitions throughout, throughout time. And then on the back end, as, as hinted, 
those concepts of healing. So, so for me, it struck a chord that, you know, the, the purposeful use of mo'olelo as you're, as you're depicting throughout the scenes. I would probably also, in, the, in, that, so in that bigger context of appreciation, um, I think there are some things, you know, we had this discussion yesterday as a team, we're going through each of the presentations that, you know, wherein does the non-native get your intention as, a, as an artist? Um, for myself as a practitioner and also being, you know, Kanaka Maoli, I, 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 can, I can translate that for myself, but then for the, say, the non-native or the non-experienced person, will, will they get the intentions of your storyline, um, yeah. specifically making those connections? That being said, maybe that's not our place to figure out today, um, but the idea of being open to still have consultation and talk story if this were the, the, the one to be selected. Um, things that struck a chord for me as ideas, and again, I only can speak as, as a native Hawaiian um, and bringing things forward from my, from my hupuna guidance and, and teachings. Um, so for example, in the creation, uh, you know, something, something that struck as an idea for me was you know, bringing forth you know, the uh, koa as a plant, right? Because koa has a very specific sickle shape and whatnot. Koa stands for warrior, mm -hmm. or the ohi alehu has symbol, you know, symbolisms, symbolisms that are inherent in at least one native culture, and there could be otherwise um, yeah. comparables in throughout. So, so those kinds of things. And so it's more of a comment, and I appreciate the fact that you're there. But I guess to the bigger question at hand is, is maybe speaking a little bit more, how, do, how would you plan to sort of strike that that balance of bringing together uh, a richness of different stories that come from the native communities, because at the end of the day, your wall is only so long and you only can tell so much, and to be an honorific with, to one without being dismissive to another is, I guess, my overall yeah. question. Are you asking me the question? Yeah, if you had, maybe you can expound upon that. that you know, how would yeah. you continue to go about the process to, to integrate, to get, to get it right, I guess? Yeah. So, like I showed you how I sent out lots of emails, I tried to learn a lot, I got a lot of uh, consultation and interaction. Uh, of course, uh, the design process was so challenging that it was hard to um, have it all and to be able to go out and um, get as much feedback as possible. So, the way I would do it would be to do more of what I have done, which would be, now it's tricky because um, everyone is going to have their opinion or their, their idea of what it looks like. And so you have to have, like I said, some idea where you, you do some designing and then some showing and then some feedback. So it can't be all feedback or all designing, it has to be a, um, a, a back and forth, a, a synergy type uh, um, uh, thing. So. But uh, the main thing is uh, with artists is, um, you know, sometimes artists will make something and then if someone wants to change it, then they'll, you know, they can get all offended or something like that, or this is how it is, it's perfect. But the main thing, especially with something like this, because it's for so many people, so many cultures, is that you'd uh, be able, you'd have to um, be willing to take uh, ideas and criticism and then, but then, of course, you have to get to a point where you, where you say, okay, this is how I think it should be, and then uh, go with it uh, when you've decided that. Um, can I just sit here? Sure. <laughs> You said that you were going to have Native American carvers. Yeah. Now, will they be carving directly into the stone, or, or, um, it, and what kind of stone is it? I just had so much information I can't remember. Yeah. So um, the way, once the narrative has been um, chosen, then uh, I'm a sculptor, and so I will sculpt it in clay probably one-third or one-half scale, and then try and work out some of the design problems there, and then uh, getting feedback along the way. Then cast it in plaster and send that to Albuquerque, because there'll be more than one carver working on it, and so we'll use that for the basis of, of uh, creating the piece. Now, the piece will be carved in stone. Um, it's still 
undecided to me what a kind of stone it should be because like the, that graphic shows the a similar stone to the building. But I'm not so sure, maybe that will be uh, to clash with the building. Uh, it's hard to say, or, or should it be the same um, tone as the path or somewhere in between? And so some designing, maybe uh, you know, computer um, renderings should be done so that we don't put, uh, have the stone put up there and realize that it's, it's not the best color or the, or the right type of stone. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, you're right. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. Uh, one of the things that uh, I noticed yesterday as we were out walking the site, mm -hmm. and I think it was in response to some of the earlier earlier input or or ask of you, was the way that you experienced this, and you placed it, I think, further to the east than it originally was mm -hmm. or whatever, so mm -hmm. that you, you come in and you experience this when the building is pulling away from the wall mm -hmm. and the water. So it really develops almost a, a separate place for it. Yeah, and if, if you, like if you go out there and you stand like in the big circle there, the entrance, so you have all that vegetation and it, it kind of is enclosing and comforting <clears throat> and then with this here, it will continue that feeling in stone. Because even with the, with the thick vegetation wooded area, you can still see the buses through uh, the uh, plants. And, and when they turn them on, that loud uh, noise, this will help to uh, create uh, a much better setting. I think also then you can start controlling the buses so it's only a good-looking bus that you look out the window <laughs> towards, right? Sure. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> um, I also really enjoy um, seeing uh, the way you have depicted uh, the uh, war service, whatever, as a continuum of a larger, as a part of a larger continuum, and I really congratulate you on that. I think Thank that's... You. A very unique approach to this. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we learn from you um, as we as we go through this, and you've contributed so much, I think, to our understanding of what this memorial could be, and how it could integrate with this great museum. Well, thank thank you. you, Leroy. Okay.